in the case, for example, of Bolivia, where we had the water war, it was against the privatization of water, against the uh, increase in the tariffs of drinking water. Uh, we are not suggesting at all that concrete struggles that have concrete demands against privatization or against commodification have now to have as their main demand the rights of nature. No, we have to keep on fighting for those concrete demands because they affect the people. But at the same time that we fight for this, and let me go to the case of Bolivia and answer the last question. In Bolivia, we won the water war. We spell the corporations, Bechtel in Cochabamba, Suez in La Paz. We managed to nationalize our main company, gas and oil company. We distributed the profit between the people. But now, when we are in the government, there is the conflict that you just highlighted, the conflict of the, between those that want to follow the same pathway of development of growing and growing and thinking on human needs, and those that say that is very important, but also we must think on how we restore a balance with our nature, with our Mother Earth. So the rights of nature is, is an appeal to think in a much broader perspective. I would say, it's a very important demand to bring it into the debate, but I wouldn't say go and do tomorrow a strike for the rights of nature, no. When it comes to the last question that is very related to this one, the issue is, they always say that. I have here many times in the climate change negotiations. I cannot reduce the greenhouse gas emissions because that is going to go against my economy. A minister from one of the biggest countries, you can imagine, of, that has the biggest population, said once to me, I know what your, your argument. I can agree with you. My heart is with you. <laughs> but we are around, you know, almost one billion. And we have to think in our people. And we cannot reduce in such a way greenhouse gas emissions. So, because otherwise I won't be able to feed my people. So, I prefer to have a more loose agreement that doesn't have strong commitments because one way I will have to do the same. So your argument is the argument that they use the biggest powers use your argument. What is our response? First response. You're th saying that now you're going to develop and that is why you don't want to do those greenhouse gas emission reductions. Watch out. Because if the whole world collapses, there won't be no development for nobody. So it is not true that you can keep developing in the developing world and for some strange reason, reason, you won't be affected by climate change. The second thing is that in reality, most of these governments of developing countries, when they use that argument, is not to redistribute that money into their own people. It's for their own bourgeoisie, for their own companies that control the government. You have had countries with uh, increase in their GDP of 8-10%. Has that represented that an increase in the income of the poorest people of 8-10%? to 10 No. From our point of view, the only way we can solve the issue that we have huge sectors of the world population without basic services or the satisfaction of basic needs is not through keep growing and keep growing because the planet has limits. It's through a process of redistribution of the resources 
that already exist and that are consumed, accumulated, and controlled by only 1% of the world population. So it is, it is not true that we are going to solve these issues through more development, more growth. We are going to solve these basic needs of the population through a just and fair redistribution of what we already are receiving from nature. So it's a change in the paradigm of how we relate ourselves with, uh, with mother. We don't think that growing and growing is going to solve the problem. That was the, the myth, the neoliberal said, don't worry. You will grow, in some way there will be some that will be richer, but at some point the poor will receive some, something. And that's not true. It won't happen. We have to, to change that way. When it comes to the issue of, um, it's not a problem of compensation, of economical cons compensation, but of restoration, that is true. Because I am very afraid. I, I discuss even with my, 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 my brothers and sisters in indigenous communities that say, OK, there is this damage. What is going to be the compensation? Of course, there has to be some kind of compensation when it affects people. But the real re compensation is not the, the economical compensation. It's the restoration of that uh, place, that forest. And this is very important because the way they are developing the green economy is, you know, there will be some insurance company. You will pay, and if something happens to this part of nature, and you have paid your insurance, you will receive money back. And that's green economy. Absolutely, we say we are against that. We need to develop from the People's World Conference on Climate Change and Mother Earth came a proposal. We need to have an, uh, a tribunal on climate change, and, uh, and in English will be ec ecology and uh, ecology and climate tribunal from the people. It is important to develop that. I think it has had good steps. We need to be in a different kind of system, not only based on what it says in the UN. If we want to do what you said, to think from our perspective, we need to go beyond the UN. In the People's World Conference on Climate Change and Mother Earth Rights, there was another proposal. If there is no solution in these negotiations, we must promote a worldwide referendum on climate change. So that means we have to begin to react as citizens of the world without being South African, German, Bolivian, American. We have to change the logic. I have been asked by many journalists, do you think that in the next COP this will be solved? And I said, what? Do you think I'm an idiot? <laughs> There has to be a, a, a change. It's a, you don't solve this through lobby or by some tactics with the negotiating team. This, this has to be built from the grassroots, from the social movements, from the civil society, through these other kind of alternatives. A climate justice tribunal from the people to develop referendums in communities, with citizens, expressing themselves. We have in our hands the internet. Are we going to be able to do a referendum? I'm not saying with the seven billion people, let's take the children out of this, three, five billion people. But can you imagine a referendum that through the internet can mobilize 500 million persons? That's a response. If we want to change this, we need to mobilize 500 million people. 
we, we have to think in the big picture. And this means we have to begin to develop other kind of initiatives and actions. It's very important, the march that we're going to have tomorrow. But how can we reach and mobilize more and more? That's the key challenge. It's the only way we're going to be able to change this tragedy that we are all facing. Because the failure of COP17 means the temperature will increase to 4 to 6 degrees Celsius in the world. There was another question that it's, yeah, it has to do with from the Marxist perspective. I, I really very much love the young Marxist because he speak about alienation. So the separation between you begin to be an object, we, you human. And yes, it's true. This also happens with nature. To restore this kind of relation is vital. It is not something new. It is, has already happened in our communities. In many communities, long far ago, in other parts, in, in Bolivia, we have communities, indigenous communities, that still practice that. And that <laughs> is uh, the memory that we must uh, take back and put into practice and to implement it. And we are not saying, please, that rights of nature is the solution to everything. Not at all. It highlights one of the issues, one of the different apartheid that we must fight. But there are the others. If we don't fight all of these apartheid, there isn't going to be a new society. That is the main uh, value added of this proposal. In this system, we are part of this system. There has been some <coughs> balance. When, when scientists say here, it's the first time that we see the temperature has increased 0 0.8 degrees Celsius because of human activity. We would say capitalist system. They are saying in the past 800,000 years, this has never happened. So it's true that from here in 1,000 million years, we will still have planet Earth. But it will be a very different planet Earth than the one we have. And I can assure you that the only change will not only be that there are no humans, but it has changed in also many other things. What does the IPCC says, for example? If the temperature goes more than two degrees Celsius, at least 20 to 30% of the biodiversity will disappear. Not only humans, the biodiversity. So we really are not saying, well, we have to preserve this because this is the way to preserve our way of life. I mean. We really think, and when indigenous people say and fight for this, is because we want to fight also for the rights of those animals and plants that today exist and that will disappear because the way we treat nature. Of course, if uh, an asteroid comes from outer space and hits the Earth, probably we all disappear. But one thing is when things change because of natural disasters that you don't have nothing to do with it. But the other thing is when what is happening now is caused by human activity and in particular by a specific way of living. This is the problem. So from our perspective and the way that's written the, the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth in Cochabamba is not thinking on humans. It's thinking on the fact that we are all part of a system. We are all part of a community. In this community, there are not only humans. 
There are plants, animals, mountains, glaciers, rivers. The concept of the declaration is very interesting because it doesn't say beings are only humans and animals or things that have life. There was a very interesting discussion there because some said, well, part of the community are only those beings that have life. And then some said, well, what do you say in life? A mountain doesn't have life? A mountain has also life. A glacier has life? Or are you saying only what we understand by living, those that in some way have a life, like an animal or like a plant? No. And the declaration says, we are speaking about everything. We are speaking about all these different elements, components of this system. The, the key proposal is, if you have a system and only one part of the system has rights and the rest part of the system doesn't have rights, would that system be balanced? We clearly say it will be always unbalanced. I mean, one of our proposals for Rio plus 20 is that, you know, the declaration, the Rio declaration, it was a very good step forward, but it says, and it's anthropocentric, its main perspective is how to satisfy the sustainable development where humans are in the center. And we say we have to change this. Not humans are in the center only. Also, nature is in the center. If we don't change this, we won't be able to have a, a system where there is a respect for its internal laws. Why is it that human laws have to be respected and the laws of nature, you just can forget about them? Why is it? So, from our point of view, it's not only a speech to protect, in a better way, human needs or human rights. It's really a change in the paradigm, in the way we relate, we see, we understand nature. The other key issue that you ask, is, it's also very important, because I can agree with you, in many cases, we have seen that the discourse of ecology, especially of conservation, has been used against poor people to throw them out of the forest, for example. We have seen that. So we need to understand that when we speak about rights of nature, we are also speaking about human rights, indigenous people's rights. And to bring a balance doesn't mean to have exclusion. That doesn't mean now you have Mother Earth's rights, and so human rights are beneath that. No, there has to be a balance. Now, there will be contradictions, yes. The contradictions between a pathway to satisfy some basic needs and the pathway to seek for this balance, for this harmony with nature, is full of contradictions. I don't see something easy in the next century even if we are able to confront and change the capitalist system, to build a different kind of society is going to take some generations. Some of the other questions that have been uh, brought, and I was writing them here, <laughs> the issue of the role. I, I don't know if you will you know, I wrote a, a public letter saying I don't agree with that role. I think that the, the key thing, and it has been a very big mistake of, of the government and the president, is to build a road through a national park. Because it will harm nature when we have other possibilities to have a road that doesn't go through that park. So, and my main message is you have to have consistency between what you say and what you do. This is the most important thing. We are not doing this in speech. We have to really change it. 
And I, I have said it to the president, the greatest damage of this road, because now the road is not going to be done, is that many movements around the world, but also in Bolivia, began to say, what you're saying is really what you intend to do. And this is something very difficult to repair when you make such a big mistake. I would say that this kind of contradictions are going to keep moving. And the only way to find the right way is to develop more and more a social movement that has uh, a clear vision of human rights, but also of Mother Earth rights. What do we intend to see here? What could be a, a, a roadmap? I think we must come very strong tomorrow. I don't know what uh, is being discussed. I, I really don't know, because at this time, it cannot be, in some way I think, you know, this is not an assembly, but not to say only, yeah, you must reduce. No, no, no. Those guys are going to be part of responsible of a genocide. We have to go very, be very strong tomorrow in our message. Uh, uh, the, the key issue is that the emission reductions are going to cook Africa and the world. What does that mean? How many millions and millions are going to die? Not only humans. They said with two degrees Celsius, 25 to 30 percent of the biodiversity is going to disappear. Can you imagine what's going to happen with four to six degrees Celsius? So the other effect is going to be in nature in an ecocide. So they're going to be responsible of a genocide and also of an ecocide. I think uh, we have said. COP17, those are a club of genocides and ecocides. We, we have to put all the pressure because there is only a few days and the worst thing that can happen is an agreement with such weak numbers and figures. Now, I think we have to come out out of Durban with a roadmap. Because sometimes people come and gather in these events and expect to have to see a change. And when that change doesn't happen, then they become pessimistic. Yeah. So we have to be prepared that that is the perspective. So we clearly have to begin to say, what are we going to do from here on? And I think when we speak about the People's World Conference and on climate change, there isn't going to be a new one next year called by the government of Bolivia. Uh, and I th don't think it's a good idea maybe to have one at worldwide level if we don't go with these People's World Conferences to the grassroots. We need to be strong in our own communities. We have to be stronger with the actions, concrete actions on the ground. And we also have to prepare ourselves for another global fight that's going to be very strong in Rio Plus 20. But we have to combine the local action for concrete and specific demands against tar sands, the privatization of water, and so on, with a clear also message that confronts the green economy, bringing in front alternatives like the rights of nature or rights of Mother Earth. So if the, the greatest challenge that we have is if we are able, from the climate justice movement, and the Occupy Wall Street movement, and the indignados in Europe, 
and the social movements in Latin, Latin America and in different parts of the world if we are able to develop more links and concrete actions together. This is the key issue. Shouldn't we come out of Durban with a clear letter to our colleagues from Occupy Wall Street and the Indignados so that we can have a common action, a worldwide action, in relation to the issue of climate change and nature, where we can say, well, now we're going to prepare all of us. What happened here in, I think it was the 15th or the 16th of October, was very important. The Occupy Wall Street made an appeal, and there were around 8,000 actions in the world. If we all come together, we can even do more. So I think that is the, the key, how we are able to assume that, of course, the fight of Occupy Wall Street against the 1% of those rich persons is also our fight. Because if we are not able to deal with them, we are not going to be able to solve the issue of, of climate change, of Mother Earth rights. But how this is clearly seen by all of us, that when we are fighting for employment, we are also fighting for Mother Earth, to change this relation with nature, to stop greenhouse gas emissions. I would say this is the challenge. And we should discuss at some stage here in Durban, what are we going to do to link our struggle with that struggle that is already happening in very concrete terms. And we must also think on other initiatives. I think the issue of the referendum of the, we must see maybe that if we prepare ourselves, we can call to referendums in very important cities or regions, or even countries. We need to begin to develop those concrete actions if we want to really change uh, the, the, the outcomes uh, that can allow us really control greenhouse gas emissions of richest countries. <laughs>